Hello, good to be back with you again. We've been with you almost a month now, actually, every day. Hopefully you've been enjoying it. Mark Thomas is here, author of 99%. How we've been screwed and how to fight back. Mark, we've been talking about a lot of very serious things, actually, because it, well, it's quite serious what's going on at the moment. There's no denying it. Mm. But I want to, uh, to talk to you today, or get you to talk to us, please, about uh, millennials and, dare I say it, people like you and me who... Uh, are sometimes rather rudely described as baby boomers. All right. So there's a, I don't know if it's exactly a state of war between the two, but certainly, you know, uh, baby boomers I know sort of say, oh, you know, millennials these days, they, they can't take it. They're walking around with enormous amounts of computing power in their pocket. They don't know when they've had it so good, really. They, they, they tweet their Instagram, the whole thing. Um, and then... The other side of the coin, I suppose, is that there's a possibly even jealousy coming from that generation towards baby boomers who do seem to have enjoyed a long period of, you know, relative economic <laughs> prosperity, something that millennials today can't look forward to. So who's right? Uh, well, I think, to be honest, by and large, the um, millennials are right. Um, mm. So... Oh. It is. It is true. You made you made the point about about the computing power, mm. and, and that is true. You know, mm. uh, most people, um, most millennials will have a smartphone, and yeah. you know, this is not even anything like state of the art. But the computing power that that phone has is far greater than NASA had when they put the man on the moon. Isn't that extraordinary? Uh, and, uh, wow. Far greater. Far greater yeah. than they could have afforded to have. Yeah. So. You know, if you think of it that way, then you would say, well, they're they're a fantastically blessed generation because they've got extraordinary access to this this computing power. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true. And certain other things are better. So when I was a child, having a foreign holiday was uh, really quite a, a luxurious oh, yeah. thing. And, uh, you know, even even um, going away for a week somewhere else in the country was um you know yeah. that wasn't bad going um uh, well, i have to say maybe, actually I mark and i mean the, now with with brexit i mean it's actually quite difficult i mean people are going to find yes. i think in the next next few months actually how difficult it is i mean you know you're gonna to have to have your own private health insurance now if you if you step foot off uh, uk soil and that could cost yeah. you quite a lot especially if you've got a pre-existing condition Yes, I mean it, it means that going to Europe will be going to like going to another country. So yeah. you know, if, if you wanted to go to yeah. India, of course you knew that you would have to be taking out comprehensive travel insurance. Well, yeah. now if you go to France, you'll be having to think the same way. So I think I think you're right, um, but nevertheless, the fact is most people um, have got used to the idea that uh, it is affordable to take a you know a cheap break. Um, in mm. Europe and sure. you know, Ryanair have a week and stuff, in Germany, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and those sorts of things weren't available forty years ago. So, no. uh, so there's that. And then, of course, the, the archetypal boomers' complaint about um, millennials spending all their money on lattes and avocados. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, you know those uh, crushed avocado <laughs> sandwiches. Well, the truth is I actually like relatively. Them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Relatively speaking, those things are both cheaper and more available. So, so there are a few things where the baby boomer argument makes a kind of sense, but it doesn't yeah. really make sense when you look at the, the important things. So, um, normally, most of these um, discussions we've had, we've put up charts with numbers on. Um, we have, but for yes. this one, I, yeah. I, I thought we we would t tackle it more qualitatively okay. because I think um, th th that makes the point actually more clearly right. so um we've got a little chart here which compares a whole range of things uh, and how they've changed over time since 1980 okay, okay. um and, and and or since before 1980 Ooh, so you can see yeah. that down at the bottom, you've got the things we've just been talking about, the technology, huh. the foreign huh. holidays, etc. Yeah. Yeah. But at the top, at the top, you've got the important things. Um, so what happens, for example, with hmm. education? Um, I, I went to university um, just at the end of the 80s. Yeah. And uh, not only did I not have to pay fees, tuition fees, I actually got a grant. 
Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, I uh, and as did everybody else who went yeah. to university, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. we all got a grant. So we were paid, we were supported by the state to uh, get a degree on the basis that that was going to be good for everybody. We would get a degree, we would sure. get a better job, we would, of course, pay more tax, and it would be good for society because yeah. we would have That's more skills than if That's we hadn't thought, been. Yeah hadn't been to university uh, and we would pay the tax which would mean the next generation could um Makes sense. could go uh, which made good sense and and worked pretty well but but gradually those things were eroded so first of all this maintenance grant was eroded and then tuition fees were introduced so as we know now if you uh, even if you just get a, a, a normal degree, which is three years, you emerge mm. with a great deal of debt. And if you do a longer Terrible. degree, like a medical yeah. degree or something, yeah. you could easily come out yeah. with 60, 70,000 pounds worth of debt, which is an awful lot of money, especially yeah. uh, given that your starting salary probably hasn't uh, risen anything like at the rate that you would have hoped. We saw what's been happening to salaries over the last 15 years, and yeah. it's not fantastic news. So. Um, uh, so th this this is a really serious issue. Secondly, there were jobs. Now, um, there, not all of that time was great. We had very very high uh, unemployment during the eighties, so that jobs availability wasn't so good. But it was actually pretty good. Um, after the late nineties and uh, up till the global financial crisis. Um, so um, so that's something which has only fairly recently uh, deteriorated, mm. um, but, but it has deteriorated. And now what we see is that um, it, an awful lot of people struggle to get what we used to call a proper job, which was a full time permanent job yeah. with a reasonable salary and reasonable prospects. Instead of um, being an Uber driver or something like that. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the headline rate of unemployment is very low, but that's because if you're working two hours a week stacking shelves at um, Asda or you, as you say, you're an Uber driver or something, mm. you don't count anymore as being unemployed you count yeah. as employed but not fully employed yeah. uh, if you look at the number of people who have what we used to call proper jobs that has been declining uh, really uh, at least for the last 10 years so uh, the job situation is worse and that's that's even more fundamental i think than the education situation so compare you, you know we're comparing now really important things like education and jobs with uh, latte and avocados so yeah. although they you know they've both shown the same on this chart some of these yeah. are much more important issues yeah, than really. others yeah. Yeah. Um, and and then you get on to pensions so uh, if you go back to the 80s and before uh, most uh, proper jobs came with a pension mm -hmm. and the pensions were what uh, technically is called a defined benefit pension and they largely don't exist anymore but uh, a, a typical defined benefit pension would say uh, if let's suppose you were to stay with that one employer for your whole career yeah. um, you would have uh, for every year that you worked with them you might have accrued one sixtieth of your salary so if you worked 40 years you would have incurred 40 sixtieths your p final pension would be two thirds of your final salary, okay. right. and that's a yeah. really good deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, those have been phased out. They've been yeah. replaced with yeah. defined contribution pensions, mm. which typically the employers put in about half what they used to put in. Oh, really? um, therefore, you know, ha half the amount of money is going in, uh, assuming the same. Um, investment returns, the pension that you'll be looking at at the end is likely to be half mm -hmm. what it would have been with the defined benefit pension. So instead of looking to retire on a two thirds of your salary, which would probably be a, a very comfortable retirement for many people, mm -hmm. uh, you're now looking at one third of your final salary, which is obviously much less comfortable. So the deal mm -hmm. that way has, has got far, far worse. And, and then we come to um, uh, housing, which is the other really big issue. Oh, yeah. Where house prices have just become unaffordable. And um, 
really uh, s since uh, the late 90s it's been getting harder and harder for um young people to be able to afford to buy a house and now yeah. uh, I, I calculated that if you were an average uh, if, if you were 20 years old and earning the average income for a 20 year old in 1980 oh. you would have taken something like seven or eight years to to save up for the deposit to buy the average house in is 1980 that is that all seven or eight years employment so you could well, you could, and, you could uh, comfortably do it by the time you're 30 it, well, exactly. And I, mm. I, I can remember, uh, I think I bought my first house at the age of 28. And I thought, why have I left it so long? Yeah, uh, because I knew yeah. a lot of other people who had bought them already. Um, and I hadn't hadn't got round to it. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, you know, now, very few people would be able to afford at the age of 28 to yeah. put down a deposit on the average house. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I calculated what how many years it would take if you were on that average salary, and the answer was something like thirty years, thirty or forty oh, years. So, uh, you know, th there's a real risk oh. of a lot of people. If we don't change policy, there's a real risk of a lot of people renting into retirement. Yeah. Now, of course, we've just talked about pensions, so the reality is that you. You, you know, you might have an okay life renting. Um, so at the age of 60, you're in a nice place that you've been renting for a few years, but suddenly your income halves and that yeah. rent is unlikely to be affordable. So you have to massively downsize at the age of 60 or 65 or 70, whenever it is, uh, uh, because uh, because you weren't able to buy and because your pension provision isn't good. So it really is a bad, it's a bad short term deal, but it's also, if we don't change things, it's a very, very bad long term deal for them as well. Yeah, this is disturbing stuff, actually, and depressing stuff. It's very disturbing stuff. It makes me think of something and, uh, that you said um, a few days ago, which is really, I mean, a lot of things are stuck in my mind. But this is stuck in my mind in particular that. It goes back to the British Constitution, really, or the mm -hmm. lack of constitution, because we don't really have much of a written constitution. Bits of it, I suppose, are written now. But there's no one document. And if it was somehow the law, the constitutional law, that it was incumbent on the government to take decisions in the best interests of most people, a lot of the problems we're seeing today simply wouldn't have arisen because it seems as if a lot of decisions now are being taken for the people right at the top of the pyramid and, and, and costing people underneath, what should we call those people, 99%? Um, costing them actually a, a huge amount. And, you know, we've talked before about how strange it is, almost unnatural, that our children are not going to be as wealthy as, as, as we were. And, you know, the millennial baby boomer thing is, is an mm. example of that. So... Does it really come down to what I'm thinking? Maybe I'm oversimplifying. I don't know that the government isn't actually ruling for the majority of us. No, I think that's exactly what it comes down to. The, you know, the, the, looking at the chart that we've just been looking at, it's not one policy change that's done this. It's a succession of policy yeah. changes yeah. over the last 40 years, all of which have gone in the same direction. And... Uh, each one individually isn't a disaster. Mm. Uh, you know, they didn't get didn't get rid of student grants in one go. They froze them and then they cut them and then they abolished them. And you know, each yeah. each individual thing is bad, but not a disaster. But when you add up forty years of these bad decisions, then you head towards disaster. And yeah. so you're exactly right. Uh, and we talked before about. Um, what sorts of steps it would need to fix that. Well, so in this case, as the title you, you have in front of you says, fixing mm. the deal, what would it take yeah. to fix the deal? Yeah, well, yeah. it would take those five actions that we talked about before. The first of which is precisely the point that you've just made, a democratic reset, which has several elements, but the most important one is to say it must be a legal and enforceably legal duty of the government to govern on mm. behalf of the entire population, mm. not a small and influential subset of that population mm. that that then needs to be translated into action but that's really fundamental the second thing 
We've talked a lot about in, in several of these conversations, which is fact-based policy. So much of policy is based on yeah. Um, yeah. this myth that we can't afford it. We talked yeah. just the other day about this myth that the government is like a household uh, and therefore you yeah. know, the debt means however sad it is, we're going to have to freeze public sector pay and we won't be able to spend on universities and schools and uh -huh etc cetera, etc cetera. so all these myth-based policies the the existence of these myths gives cover for bad policies sure once you get to fact-based policy you're much more likely to take the right decision so uh, re a real insistence that the policies must be based on fact not myth is very very important mm. um and then we talked uh, i think a, a week or two ago rowena asked a question about Oh, yeah. uh, the kinds of policies that we've had too many of and too few yeah. of and we said yeah. well there are just those four types of policies and we've had too many captured growth policies which benefit the rich and vulture policies which actually um, don't just benefit the rich they actively harm everybody else as well yeah. Yeah. and we've had far too few shared growth policies and balancing policies to make yeah. sure that the 99 percent of the population see themselves moving forward year by year instead mm. of moving backwards which is what mm. has been happening yeah. um, so that's the third one and then a big part of that is that we need to invest wisely in the future because of this myth of unaffordability we've been under investing in almost everything education healthcare, infrastructure research you name it we've been under investing and that's very very bad for almost everybody in the country mm. and then finally we had this point about cleaning up capitalism creating clean competitive markets by creating financial incentives for businesses to behave well mm. and leveling the playing field so that the ethical businesses have a chance to outcompete the unethical ones rather than the other way around so if we did those five things then we would fix the deal that's what well, we need to do there now we go. there we go there we go mark sorted it out <laughs> it's not that difficult actually is it it's not that difficult i think it's, it's a question of seeing well, things in right. a slightly no, you, different way really just really it is, and, you know, it. when you when you say these things individually people mm. they sound so obvious that people say yeah. well you know that goes yeah. without saying of course yeah. the government should govern for the people of yeah. course the policies should be fact-based yeah. well yeah, of course they should be, but the evidence is they are not. So we need to change. Yeah. So this is what what I mean when I talk about being radical without revolutionary. You know, these mm. things are just common sense, but mm. we're not doing them, and that's mm. why we have this mess that we're in. So we I've need got to a do feeling it is going to change. I think I think it's got to change. But the question in my mind is: Is it going to be a peaceful transition to a fairer society, or are we in for a lot of trouble? I don't know. Um, Mark, um, thank you very much again for today's insights. You can get Mark's book, 99.redhammer.tv. That'll take you, take you straight through to the Amazon page where you can get it in paperback or on Kindle. Tomorrow, I'm looking forward to it already because we're going to be asking your questions to Mark. Oh, yes, that's going to be good. See